overcome his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so And welcome to our worship for this morning, which is Sunday the 23rd of August and the 11th Sunday after Trinity. My name is the Reverend Charlotte Cheshire and I am priest in charge of Christ Church Mulgreen and St James Rothorpe in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire. Today, I'd like you to ponder something for me. If four of your friends were asked to write a book about your life, what do you think would be in it? What would be the things about you that would be the most important or relevant to remember? What would be the things you wish they would forget? Who would your friends say that you are? I'd like to encourage you to ponder that for me this morning as we begin our worship. So let's take a moment of quiet now. Perhaps you might choose to light a candle. Perhaps you might simply choose to think about those questions. And in a moment, we will pray.
So we begin our worship this morning with a prayer. Gather us, O God, and we will know your life that makes us one. Gather us, O God, and we will celebrate our variety and uniqueness. Gather us, O God, and we will give you the pain of our brokenness. Gather us, O God, and we will share the gifts of your spirit. Trinity of love, bind us as one. That our brokenness be healed by you. That our fears be held by you. That our gifts be used by you. That our lives be offered to you so that the world may believe. Amen. And so we pray our collect prayer for this morning. Gracious God, open our ears that we may hear your voice. Open our hearts that we may seek your wisdom. Open our minds that we may discern your truth. Prepare us to worship and to live right. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in heaven, on earth, and here in our midst. Amen. And we bring before God the events of this past week, the things we have said and done, the things we have neglected to say or do, the ways in which God's creation is broken. We lay all of these things before God, remembering that God is our loving Father, who always extends mercy to us. Let's pray. Let us come to God and seek the truth that will set us free. Lord, this morning we confess that we sometimes put people into boxes that are too small for them. May we be gracious as you have been gracious. Lord, this morning we confess that we sometimes apply stereotypes to people that are superficial and wrong. May we be gracious as you have been gracious to us. Lord, this morning we confess that we sometimes get caught up in the judgments that have already been made about people. May we be gracious, even as you have been gracious to us. Let us worship God who gives people a new life, a new chance and a new name. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has vanished. See, everything has become new. Amen. And so to all and to each where regret is real, God pronounces pardon and grants us the right to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Majesty, God of heaven, living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end. All within me falls at your throne.
The reading is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. Thank you, Faith. That was very much appreciated. Now, I wonder how you answered that question that I posed to you at the beginning of the service. If four friends were tasked with writing a book about your life, what would be in it? What would you wish them to leave out? What would you wish them to include? And do you believe that their answers would define you, would define the essence of who you actually are? This is, of course, the sort of information that goes well beyond first impressions into the depths of you as a person. Now, this sort of task is harder than you might think. Allow me to give you an example. Think about those times that you've been in some form of group, often at church, sometimes at work, where the group leader will attempt to stage an icebreaker. The sort of thing that brings most group participants out in chills. As they will ask you to introduce yourself by name, to give a reason why you are there and participating in the group, and finally to offer one fact about yourself that the other members of the group wouldn't know. In my experience, that last is the hardest question ever to answer. What is there that's interesting about me? And perhaps more importantly, even if I can come up with an idea, is it something that I actually want others to know about? And funnily enough, in this week's Gospel reading, we encounter a situation rather similar to this, as Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road when he asks them, Who do you say that I am? What a way to put his friends on the spot. Should they give a practical answer? Well, Jesus, you are our friend, our teacher, our guide. Or should they attempt to give a deeper and more profound answer? You are a prophet, sent from God, the Messiah. Either way, they risk being both right and wrong because Jesus is their teacher, friend and guide, but he is also so much more than this in a way that none of them have really fully grasped yet and won't until after his death and resurrection. Now, in the past, I've always assumed that this was sort of a group discussion, with Jesus speaking to all of the disciples and each one in turn, then throwing out different names and opinions on who Jesus is for all to hear. But recently, another clergy friend of mine suggested that Jesus might have been drifting among the group as they walked and individually, quietly, asking each one of his friends to answer this question for themselves. That perhaps puts a different spin on it than if this was some kind of group debate. Perhaps it makes the question quieter, more personal, closer to an invitation to make a confession of faith, directly to the one who asks it. But regardless of how the conversation happens, 
each one of the disciples give Jesus different answers. Some of them say, you are Elijah. Others, John the Baptist. And others, slightly less specifically, one of the prophets. Each one of these is a qualified answer that seems to indicate that Jesus is some sort of holy person, a, a teacher, someone with a great deal of wisdom and religious knowledge, perhaps as a prophet, even someone who has a direct line to God. But it is only Peter, impulsive, headstrong, opinionated Peter, who says clearly and simply, you are the Messiah. I wonder if he was surprised to be asked. Perhaps the answer had seemed obvious to him for some time, where the others remained confused. Christ then praises Peter, saying that on the rock of this faith, the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the church will be founded. It was this confession that prompted the church fathers to believe that Peter was the first pope, a word that itself comes from the Latin and literally means papa or father. Now, certainly the role that we now know as the Pope has developed quite significantly over the years, but it was originally founded on a confession of faith of Christ as the Messiah. And then, quite extraordinarily, Christ doesn't tell them to share this news with the world, but instead sternly orders all of them to keep quiet about it. I wonder why he might have done that. After all, he's only just drawn a confession of faith out of them, but is then immediately silencing them. Is it that Jesus thinks they're wrong? Or is it more likely that he knows a declaration of this sort of faith immediately puts all of their lives in danger? We may possibly have the answer to that particular question if we were to read onwards into the following verses, as Jesus goes on to teach them about his impending suffering, rejection, and death, followed three days later by a resurrection. But that particular part of the story is one that we'll consider in our worship next week. So let's, for now, stay with this at once simple and yet immensely profound question that Jesus asked of his friends that day. Just imagine with me for a moment that you can see Jesus standing here in this room where you are, and he asks you, who do you say that I am? What would your answer be? I wonder if you might prevaricate uncertainly. Well, Jesus, I believe that you're a good man, uh, a teacher, maybe even a prophet, but as to the rest, I'm not really sure. If Jesus asked this question of you, would you be in the group who just aren't able to make a full commitment to the reality of Christ and his identity? Or perhaps, if Jesus were to ask, who do you say that I am? You might be with impulsive, faithful, hopeful Peter. Perhaps you might be able to speak up strongly and say, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, my Saviour and my Lord. Many of you will be familiar with C.S. Lewis, the author and theologian who wrote numerous books about Christianity, including, of course, the famous children's series about Narnia. But in one of his other books, The Case for Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrestles with this identity of Christ. Was he merely a man, or was he a god? And when you consider some of the things he says about himself, what do you do with that? Finally, Lewis comes to the following conclusion, and he says this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said 
would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Those words pack a punch, as C.S. Lewis's writings so often did. He didn't take any prisoners with the conclusions that he came to, but it offers much food for thought. So in the end, this question of who do you say that I am is the question of our faith. And how you choose to answer is pivotal in directing where your life goes from here. Who is Jesus for you? And based on the answer to that question, what are you going to first say and then do about it? Amen. and shake and crumble at your name the oceans roll and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry
So in common with Christians around the world, we remain united by what we believe, and we confirm this in making a statement of our faith. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth and the place of death. On the third day he rose from the tomb, he ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the Church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. Gathered as the Church of God, members of the Body of Christ, let us pray together. Fill your Church, O Lord, with life and energy, spiritual health and vitality. As we feed on you, may we grow more like you. May we exercise your loving, minister with your tenderness, serve with your humility, and cooperate with your vision. In you, O Lord, is all meaning and truth. Fill your world, O Lord, with wonder at creation, recognition of our mutual human responsibility, desire for reforming what is at fault, and hope in the possibilities of living at peace with God and with one another. In you, O Lord, is all meaning and truth. Fill our homes and neighbourhoods, O Lord, with the generosity and trust that allows space, but is always ready to encourage and support. May we cherish our bodies, minds and spirits as temples containing your spirit and honour one another as people of your making. In you, O Lord, is all meaning and truth. We pray for all who are ill at home or in hospital, for all in emergency surgery or in casualty, for those who have just discovered that they have injuries or illnesses that will change their lives. We pray for the work of all who heal and comfort, all who visit the sick and counsel the distressed. In you, O Lord, is all meaning and truth. We pray for the dying and those who love them. We pray for those who have completed this life and have made the journey through death. We pray for the work of those who comfort the bereaved. In you, O Lord, is all meaning and truth. Fill our hearts, O Lord, with thankfulness and praise as we recall your faithfulness and live in your love. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we pray as our Lord taught us in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, for ever and ever. Amen. And so as our worship comes to a close this morning, we ask for God's blessing to be upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us to share in God's story of hope, and so we offer ourselves to its telling. Breathe your life through ours, so that the story may continue on in us, and through us until the world is remade. Amen. You are called and loved by God, 
and protected by his son, Jesus. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. It's growing deep inside of me Every time I see you All your goodness shines